Actually, so how do I? Okay. Like Mark, uh, you, you could you could cross build on x86 and build uh, it's not even a cross compiler, it was just something about it, which is name trying to install. Um, anyway, so uh, Robert builds the um, ImagesNet, and he's got a, he's got shells and various smart boards. Um, I'm pretty sure he builds some, some uh, like Cortex A1 machines, like quad cores, but he's got like server class machines that he's got shells from. Yeah. Um, so he does that now, so I don't worry about it. So I haven't really touched one of them. It's just a question about this. It's a lot of really just people who are able to install one of these on the top there. It's pretty easy to use. So Robert will be working on this. He's got a machine. So I'm not seeing myself, so I don't know when I'm, when I'm centered here. But, yeah. Um, Okay. I don't know. Are we doing the camera or, or we're just doing the screen, I guess? So, okay. Um, so it's it's lagging like 30 seconds behind. Can we turn that off? No, that's fine. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm John Elson. Uh, I, I created uh, Pico Systems uh, about uh, 30 years ago to, uh, to make a very, uh, there we go to make a variety of uh, products and uh, have slowly moved over towards uh, more and more motion control uh, systems. Uh, in the picture is my uh, 19, uh, 1938 Bridgeport uh, manual mill. Uh, in uh, uh, 1996, I converted that to a CNC using an Allen Bradley controller that I bought off a guy on eBay. And I used that for about a year. Uh, it worked. It got me into CNC, which was great, and uh, um, found many, many advantages in being able to have accurate positioning and such. But uh, uh, it kept breaking, and it was also pretty limited. Uh, and so then uh, I got in touch with uh, Matt Shaver, uh, who was the first outside user of the NIST, the original EMC package. Uh, and said, oh, wow, that sounds fantastic. This is what I was looking for. And so I became the second outside user of the original EMC. And I, I, I put some uh, DB25 plugs so I could switch back and forth between the Allen Bradley and the uh, uh, original version of EMC and uh, had a couple issues with it. And at that time, it was supported solely by, by NIST. And so I would email Fred Proctor with what, what I found was not working right. And a couple days later, he would uh, send me by uh, US Post a, a CD. This is back in the dial-up era. You didn't want to download a, uh, a CD-ROM uh, over a dial-up line. Um, and so uh, I ran that from uh, 1998 or so under uh, EMC and uh, then have upgraded several times since then. Um, so anyway, that's how I got into the CNC motion control interest and started uh, with Matt, started uh, designing some uh, interfaces. Uh, at the time, the only thing that we had for uh, uh, running EMC on a, uh, uh, an x86 processor was the servo to go board, which is an ISA board, has never been updated. They're still selling an ISA board if you can find an ISA motherboard. Um, and it had some limitations. It had a had a glitch when it rolled over from minus zero to positive zero. Uh, it would occasionally uh, give you wildly incorrect uh, uh, position counts for one one sample. And we actually had to write code in there that if the uh, position this sample is impossibly largely different than the, the position last time. Just keep the one from last time and it'll be okay next sample. Um, but that would cause people's uh, servos to trip offline and such. Um, so anyway, we started making our own uh, analog velocity servo interface, then got into uh, stepper controllers, and then I started making my own line of uh, PWM controllers and servo amps. So I have a whole uh, manufacturing facility there. Um, 
let's see here. So I got got a. Uh, you know, these are some pictures of the, of moving it in. Um, there's the. You know, it's kind of a dark picture there. Lower right is uh, is the the pick and place machine. Uh, you can also see it on a uh, a chain of. Uh, uh, three-quarter inch plywood as I was moving it in with the forklift truck. Um, so anyway, this is a, a real commercial uh, grade um, 3,000 to 4,000 component per hour uh, machine um, that cost somebody $100,000 and cost me quite a bit less. Um, and uh, so I, I use that to run uh, all the boards that I make for motion control, such as, and now making the cramps boards also. Uh, the cramps boards require a lot of uh, manual handling afterwards. One side has all the surface mount components, but then you have all these uh, um, through hole parts, uh, mostly connectors that have to be placed in, and then, then we dip solder it in a, uh, a solder bath. Um, so anyway, the uh, uh, have this whole facility for making these things. Um, um, I'm trying to think of which order I want to do this in. So anyway, one of the other gadgets that I built was a uh, a photo plotter. I built this in 1996, actually before I had the milling machine working in uh, in CNC mode, and. Uh, there's a, a picture of it. Let me actually blow this one up. Uh, it's not what I want to do this. Oh, this browser doesn't let me do this. Uh, what I want to do is, oh, maybe I can open image in new tab. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, there we go. So uh, this thing has a drum which rotates at 10 revolutions per second. Um, let's see if I can highlight the, this. This is the drum. It's, it was actually made out of plexiglass because I had the idea that I'd make it as a scanner as well as a plotter. And of course now there's no purpose in, in making your own scanner. You can just buy one at the local, uh, local shop. Um, there's a... Uh, a motor out of a uh, Cume daisy wheel printer over here and an encoder over here produces 1,024 pulses per revolution. Uh, that goes into a phase lock loop to set the rotation speed of the drum and it also goes into a digital phase lock loop to multiply it by 20 producing 20,480 uh, pixel pulses per revolution. And the drum was machined to be the right diameter, 6.519 inches. So it has a circumference of 20.480 inches. And if you have uh, 20,480 pulses per revolution, then you get uh, a pixel clock every thousandth of an inch around the circumference. Uh, there's also a lead screw here. Uh, I'm using a, uh, a Kirk. Uh, motion uh, that's a rolled uh, screw with a plastic anti backlash nut, uh, which is behind the optical carriage here. And then there's a little stepper motor here, standard 200 uh, uh, step per revolution uh, motor. So that gives you a thousand uh, steps per inch uh, in linear travel. Uh, in here, there's a little five milliwatt red laser diode and some optics that focuses it down on a spot. So you, you tape uh, red sensitive uh, film, silver, silver type film onto the drum and uh, put a little cover over the thing to keep the light off of it. And it spins at 10 revolutions per second. So it's writing 10 uh, 10 raster scans around the drum every second. Uh, so that produces a six tenths of an inch of plot per minute. So a six inch plot takes 10 minutes um, of any complexity. Uh, 
one of the other issues I had with this thing is the, the program I originally put this on, the first version of the program had the plot rasterizing and the, the plot output all in one program. Uh, but this was run in a Windows 95 machine and because Windows 95 allowed a user mode program to go in and control the DMA controller and the DMA interface board. Uh, and later systems, you had to write a VXD, and I didn't have the software toolkit to do that. So I split the program, left the, the one piece in Windows 95, and moved the other program up to a 32-bit Windows environment where I had a lot more memory for the, uh, uh, the apertures. And so the, uh, uh, the severe memory constraints went away by going to a 32-bit uh, Windows implementation. Uh, and then I realized year, years after year that this uh, Windows 95 system was essentially unreplaceable with, with ISA bus and everything else. And one of these days, it wasn't going to boot. And so I started thinking, how am I going to fix this? And I was thinking, you know, some kind of little USB device, whatever. And eventually figured, oh, I could use a BeagleBow and the PRU. So I came up with this idea. So first, uh, the the PRU in its native form has very limited memory. There's two 8K memories and a 12K memory. And so I thought, well, I could take and compress the data, compress the raster lines by run length encoding before I put it into the, uh, the, the shared memory, the 12K shared memory of the BeagleBone. And that should always be enough to hold one raster line in the compressed form. So I, I came up with a scheme how to do this. Um, you have a 16-bit word, two bytes, and the high byte is a uh, uh, either turn the laser on or turn the laser off, and the low 15 bits are a count. How many times do I repeat that? Now, the pixels are being pumped out at a rate of every five microseconds, 200K pixels per second. And bit flipping something at 200K bits per second sounds like a real challenge, except for how fast the PRU is. It's not any problem. So I wrote some code that uh, decompresses the run length encoding uh, in live time as, as the pixels are being cycled out. So this thing has uh, four, four circuit boards down here. There's a, a drum motor controller, a stepper motor controller, uh, the, an interface board that has all the uh, uh, clock multiplying and stuff in it. All right, I guess it's a control board. And then an interface board that was just wired to be direct plug-in to the, uh, the Metrobyte uh, DMA controller that, that was in the ISA slot. And so I thought, well, you know, since I don't know this thing's going to actually work uh, without a lot of work, uh, I should make the uh, the BeagleBone side look identical to that Metrobyte interface, every pin in the same place doing the same function, and then I can switch back and forth till I get it working. Um, I didn't need to worry because it, it worked. It, it was amazingly easy. So, uh, and this also gets into some of the synchronization issues that people have been talking about. Um, because I've got the PRU processor, which is totally asynchronous to the ARM processor. The ARM processor is putting data into the PRU's shared memory. The PRU is processing it and then sending back the semaphore saying, I'm done. So what I did is I have the first word, the first 16-bit word of the, uh, uh, the PRU shared memory is the semaphore. Uh, it starts out as zero. And I put one in it, and that tells the PRU to run a routine which seeks the carriage to the left till it hits a home switch. And uh, then it zeroes the semaphore, telling the arm everything is safe to move to the next step. Next step is it puts a two there. Uh, and this, I'm using one, two, four, and eight because I, I, I want it to be bit atomic, so there's never any confusion with what whether the bits are coherent. So the, uh, then it, it sets a two in there, and the two means wait for the uh, phase lock loops to indicate stable for one second, uh, locked for one second. 
then it zeroes the semaphore, then it goes into the plotting loop, and it puts a four in there. At, well, first it puts the stream of run length encoded uh, words into the PRU memory, then it writes a four in the semaphore. That means generate the plot. It generates the plot. And when it gets done, it signals the photo plotter to step to the next raster line, step the stepper motor to the next raster line, and zeroes out the, uh, the semaphore to tell the arm, put the next word in. Oh, it knows the end because uh, on these, these words, the, uh, the repeat count should always be non-zero. And so if the repeat count is ever zero, that means you're done with this line. And then the last thing it does is after the last plot line has been set, it gets two zeros in a row, which is the flag for end of file, and it sends an eight to the PRU, which means turn the motors off and, and exit the PRU program, halt, halt the PRU and interrupt the, uh, the arm to tell it the, the PRU is finished. And it was amazingly simple stuff. Uh, there's limited debug capability on the PRU, but because there's three memories, I was able to uh, uh, simulate all the functions it was doing, such as the, uh, the run left unpacking, by giving it the data in one memory and having it, instead of unpacked to the laser, it was unpacking to the other memory, and then I could have a, an ARM program read that block of memory and just dump it on the screen and fiddle around a little bit till the PRU code was doing what it was supposed to do. Um, so this thing was an amazing uh, job. It took me about two days to go from some little little pieces of sample code to the complete machine running 100% uh, perfectly. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of items here. This is, a, this is actually a so this is, uh, I'll pass it around, this is a photo plot off of that machine, and that's a, a pattern for a uh, solder sensor. And those are then, you use a pair of those, one is mirror image to the other, glued together in alignment. You take a piece of brass shim stock, this is three thousandths of an inch shim stock, and you laminate it with uh, dry film resist, the same stuff they make. Uh, PC boards with. You expose it with UV light through those uh, photo masters, and then you etch it with ferrochloride just like it's a PC board. Uh, watch the edges, the edges can be sharp. So that's, uh, that's one of the, the processes I have in my shop for making uh, printed circuit boards is to, uh, to make these solder stencils, and you then take the solder paste and sweep it through the stencil. It puts the paste on the circuit board. Now, one of the tricks here is that output from the photo plotter has to be very, very dimensionally accurate. Because if it's more than a few thousandths of an inch off over the whole size of the board, the, those little solder uh, bricks uh, will not be sitting right on top of the pads where they need to be, and you'll get solder shorts. And so I, I worked very hard on this machine to make it dimensionally accurate. Uh, and actually, you can see there's a, a sort of whitish uh, matte finish thing. That's a shim. I, I intentionally made the drum a little bit undersized because I didn't know exactly how high the photosensitive layer in the film was going to be. And depending on where that is in the film, it will change the circumference. And so if I change to a different film, I have to change the shim, and I, I, I measure it until it lines up, and then I know I got it right. Um, so that's, that's one of the processes in my system. Um, then the other thing, after you, you make the, uh, the stencil, I've got a, a toaster oven with a uh, thermocouple temperature controller in it, and that's what I heat the boards to reflow the uh, uh, the solder onto the components. So uh, let's see, where are we here? So that's part of my process there. Um, now let's see if I can find this other. 
Okay. So um, this is a craps board. Um, probably a lot of people who are following the machine kit know about the craps board. I started making these. Uh, Charles designed it and then uh, made a, a modest number of the boards uh, by hand himself and then later uh, was making kits available to people. And he found this to be a, a big hassle. Um, I, I don't want to make you sick, but I'll tell you, <laughs> these boards take less than three minutes on the pick and place machine. To oh, place I all all the surface mount components. I know, it took me just, over a half an hour at least, I think. I can't believe it's, you can do it in that little time. And it's, yeah. Um, to fully put one together, I think, took about four hours. Yeah, with, with the, the through hole stuff. With the through hole. But the through hole stuff goes fast compared to the surface mount by hand. And I don't know how your eyes handle I mean, I, I would do this stuff under a microscope. Uh, 0805. These are, the, these are the big <laughs> surface big mount. Big? Those are the big surface mount components. Like, well, the, the first version I mean, has some I, I tiny ones do, on it. I normally do 0805 um, because those I can do with tweezers if I if I need to. These 0603s are so small, you don't want to do them with tweezers. Yeah, 805 is a lot easier by hand. Absolutely. Uh, one problem I had was the 0605, 0603 uh, LEDs were so small that my pick and place machine could not pick them up. The cross sectional area didn't give it enough vacuum. And as it was lifting it out of a little pocket in the tape, it would always fall off. So I figured out that I could use the next size up LED. It had a larger top, and I, I've got some others that are um, that are just loose, so you can see them. I'll pass them still test targets, or? but anyway, yeah, th this is my test board. So I have the Beagle set to the side so that I have my production socket over here, and it's just, just wired across with a million wires. So I can actually pull the, uh, the cramps board out while it's powered on and stick the next one on and so on. I was thinking of putting these pololus on the, the, the spring contact pins, and I haven't done that yet, so you have to actually place all six of them in there. But now if you look at the screen, you can see I've got the, uh, the limit switches all set up here so I can test the limit switches. Um, I can test the, uh, the the temperature input, and if I had a power supply hooked up, um, you can see I can. Uh, yeah. And I also have the the temperature input goes through the the PID and comes out on all the uh, uh, the the heater switch mm -hmm. switches, so that those light up yellow and flicker. So I can, and also I've got some little red green LEDs on the. Uh, uh, the Pololu outputs, and so I can uh, give commands on the. Uh, yeah, I got to get out of e-stop, and then I can uh, uh, I can jog and, and so on. And these, these, these lights would yeah. flicker. Yeah. Cool. So that's how I test all the uh, the cramp boards. Excellent. Well, I am I am so happy that you are doing this because I. Yeah, uh, I'm not set up to do production for uh, uh, any, uh, anything. So Well, so I knew how to do the, the surface mount stuff, other than this little issue with the, the component sizes. These are a little smaller than the ones I was normally working through. I had to actually realign my machine uh, because the, uh, the, the these 0603 parts are so much smaller than the 0805 that it was coming in on the side of them a little bit, and they they tilt and stuff. But I was able to realign the machine so it, it uh, solved that problem. So then I had the problem of there's, I think there's 30 connectors on here or something that are all through hole uh, mounted. And uh, Charles suggested, oh, you want to dip solder that. So I went and bought a, uh, a big solder pot. It's a five by seven inch uh, solder pot from China for 300 bucks. And uh, it it works kind of, and so I, I've been learning how you uh, the, the trick is in lifting the board out of the solder. And I found out the trick is you got to get down on your elbows. I've got this thing that's it's like a giant set of tongs with fingers at just the right space to, to grab where there's nothing on the edge of the board. And you, you pick the board up, you dip it into the solder, you tilt slightly to the side, and then you raise it incredibly slowly. 
Well, that's a possibility. Is it possibly uh, a machine would do it better? What I had been doing is I would just dip it in, move it around a little bit, and lift it out. And as the solder tension, the solder starts to drop away, the tension is reduced, and you tend to jerk it up. And then you get these icicles dangling and, and shorts on it. And so I found out that by lifting it very slowly, you got perfect boards. So sometimes I still get perfect boards, and sometimes I still get the icicles because I don't do it just right. So I'm still learning that, but uh, it's it's becoming more and more manageable. Well, the other thing is the first couple boards I did, or first couple batches, it took me about an hour to put all the components on and the the, th the through hole. And now that I I know it, I'm just going plunk 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 plunk, and it, it only takes about five ten minutes, something like that. So it's it's getting better. But so. Wave machines are perfect for this application. I wish I had a wave machine, but they have a couple problems. One of them is that they're they're quite large. They draw a huge amount of power because they have a big vat. And the second thing is they need ten thousand dollars in solder. You, you, you fill these things up, and they have gallons of solder. And I have to use SAC 305, the silver bearing solder, and that's out of the question. <laughs> so um, there are also selective solder machines. That they have a, a little pump and a fountain of solder, and so you actually CNC program it, and it just walks along soldering all the rows. And I'd love to have one of those. Uh, this guy in uh, the Netherlands, Peter, oh boy. Peter Blodow, or Blodow, or is am I getting the wrong name? I don't know. There's a guy in the Netherlands that uh, that actually built his own uh, solder fountain machine, and I mean, he built his own. He had uh, a titanium impeller machine for him by a guy who knew how to machine titanium because uh, anything else it, it it'll alloy and amalgamate yeah, and it'll just it, it, well, it's not eventual it's not eventual yeah. if you use lead free solder it's like you get one one batch out of it and oh. the impeller will be gone yeah i don't know about the lead free the the old lead stuff you could use stainless steel I think. right but okay. yeah, stainless steel will not survive so well, like my, yeah. my solder pot is is titanium it has a titanium bucket because the stainless steel will not last. So, yeah, anyway. even gold dissolves in solder. Oh yeah, well sure, it always has. It, that'll dissolve in uh, in leaded solder too. Uh, the leaded solder happens to generate a gentle in, uh, intermetallics, but the uh, the high tin stuff tends to generate Nasty. brittle. Yes. Uh, I I had the first boards I made for lead free. Uh, my board house recommended uh, gold flash, and it was a catastrophe. I should have thrown the boards out because either their process was no good or something. But uh, after you wait or uh, reflow solder these boards, uh, you get maybe on the, the FPGA, you get maybe 20 bad solder joints on each FPGA, and you could, once it had attempted to be soldered, uh, it, it generated this black crud, and you could not get a solder joint. The only way you could fix it, you, you remove all the solder, you fold the lead up with a, the end of an exacto knife, and then you scrape the thing down to bare copper, tin it, then you fold the lead down and solder it. It was a catastrophe. I can't believe what that one put me through. Um, so, no more gold. I think that's most everything. Uh, I usually used to finish these things with some what I call machine porn, which is uh, Stuart, vi YouTube videos of Stuart Stevenson's uh, big uh, CNC machine, that is the Cincinnati 5 axis. So I don't know, does anybody want to see that? Sure. sure. All right, let me see if I can find this. Um, all right, so we'll close this. Here. 
two talks remaining for the day. So we have now it's a quick BCP tutorial. Charles, uh, Charles. Platforms. Um, just platforms. We we won't do more than the star. More than the star? Yeah. I know it's shocking. But uh The uh, x86 platform, if you yeah. just want to build a machine and run it, what it generally is. Like, is it? I don't know if this is broadcasting that audio also or not. Oh, yes. Yeah, so this is a five axis a Cincinnati CNC mill at uh, MPM in Wichita. That's Stuart Stevenson. Uh, he did the conversion. He's putting a tool in now. He's got some guts standing right next to that thing while it's moving. Um, and it's using uh, my uh, analog velocity servo interface, uh, the PPMC, and it's using the original uh, Fanuc Gettys uh, servo amps, which are enormous. They're three foot of a 19 inch relay rack per axis. Uh, this was, these were designed in the days when the only tr power transistors available were designed for uh, car radio amplifiers. So they, they were designed for 12 volt power supply. Uh, so this thing has like 200 transistors in parallel, uh, has a split power supply, so they only need a half bridge to drive the DC motor. The DC motors are eight pole, and they're, I don't, I don't know what, 250 amperes peak at about 24 volts. Um, so th there is no substitute, a modern substitute for such a servo amplifier. They just it is not made, so you have to deal with the old ones, but they were well built. Um, so anyway, he did a whole kinematics job on this machine. Uh, th this machine is built in several pieces. There's a bed which you see uh, traveling horizontally. That is bedded into the floor. Then there is a column or pillar behind it where the y-axis and z-axis are installed on top of. And the, uh, the millwrights who do this get it as close as they can get it, but on a machine this size, it can't be perfect. And so the, uh, the table is not exactly uh, orthogonal to the y-axis, which is a, a linear rail coming out toward you. Um, <clears throat> also, because of the weight of the table, it tends to arc slightly as it travels from the left side to the right side. Then the other problem is there's some machining errors in the head where the, uh, the B and C axes swivel. They're supposed to be exactly on center and they're a couple thousandths out, which is about as good as you can do in a welded assembly of this size. Um, and he wanted to correct out all of those errors. And so he built a huge matrix. He has the measuring equipment, he has a uh, uh, there's Faro, and I think he has a Heidenhain optical tracker, uh, which is incredibly accurate machine that can, can measure positions over a large area to optical levels. So he measured out all the errors in the machine and then built a mathematical matrix for when the machine is at this position, it will affect these other axes in this way. So it's not just correcting for an error in the individual axis. You, you, you read the errors on one axis, and then you correct all the other axes stacked on top of it for that error, and you just work up the chain to the last axis. And he got it. He, there's another test there. Um, maybe I'll just kill this one, and we'll go to the other one. Um, 
not a full screen. So he has a big sphere. Uh, I think it's mounted in the spindle, and then the he has a, a set of uh, three dial indicators mounted on a, a little uh, X Y Z block. And uh, now he's going to do. He's making five axis moves here and watching to see, see he's, he's got the x-axis sliding to one side as the head tilts in the, I guess that's the b-axis, and he's watching those indicators to make sure that as it moves through all of these gyrations in all five axes at once, that the indicators do not move. And that proves that his kinematics are exactly compensating for everything in the machine, including the errors, not just the motion, but the errors in the motion. Uh, pretty crazy stuff. And I think it's at some point I, the indicator on the bottom bumped a little bit, and I think that's the backlash. So anyway, that's that's incredible stuff. So are there any questions? Uh, the Cincinnati? No, the cramps. Oh, the cramps. I've got a whole box of them. Yeah. Yeah, so I can show those in a bit. Any other questions? Thanks, so, Joe. Oh. Dude, I got a stump down. Further away. Stump. Oh, stop right. Yeah. yeah.